I'm going to be talking about generating ungrammatical data by corruption and exactly what that means and why I'm trying to do such a wonky thing. My name is Pablo Gonzalez. Uh, I'm a PhD student in linguistics at the Graduate Center. I work on NLP and computational linguistics, specifically in machine learning and uh, language modeling. And I've always found myself being the external guy in some field. There was a professor in college, I was doing literature and mathematics, and he always said, as a literature student, I was a very good mathematician. And uh, I've kind of defined myself through that kind of thing. So now I'm the computer guy in the linguistics department and the linguistics guy at the computer conference. Uh, so we're going to see if that benefits any of the fields. Um, so first, what is a language model? Most people here will know what a language model is. It's basically a component in an NLP system that wants to tell you if that string is likely to occur within your data. Uh, you can think about it in speech systems, for instance, when I'm saying the next word to Siri, I want it to be a word that is likely to occur there. And I want uh, outputs that would not concur with that to be uh, penalized. In machine translation systems, uh, the, natural langu the language model is in charge of assuring that the sentence sounds like a sentence in the language or seems a sentence in the language. So between two translations, the one that has the better evaluation through the language model is the one that will be qualified as more fluent. Uh, that is exactly what I just said. So what do we do in linguistics with respect to this? Well, in linguistics we have a notion that is related, but it's not exactly the same. It's what we call grammaticality. Grammaticality says whether a string of words is or is not part of a language. Any notion that makes the instincts of a person who speaks the language tingle and say that's not a sentence will uh, make the sentence what we call ungrammatical. This is a notion uh, used across modern linguistics. So uh, how is grammaticality or how humans do it differently from language models or how computers do it? Well, language models return a number. A language model just says this is 0.75 good, and this other one is 0.98 good. So let's take the second one. It usually compares the likelihood of several candidates. So let's go back to the machine translation system. I have two likely translations of a given sentence. It will tell me which one looks more like the language. How exactly it does that? We're going to get a little bit into it, but I'm afraid I won't be able to go in depth. Uh, grammaticality on the other side is a binary decision. A sentence is or is not grammatical. If I say the sentence, uh, I orange is like, any native, English, uh, native speaker of English will tell me that is not a sentence. They won't give it a score, even though there's some dissent in linguistics about this, but of course we don't have time for that. Um, so in the context of translation, as I've already mentioned, a uh, human translator will only produce grammatical sentences, whereas a machine translation system will produce a mix of different degrees of fluency and then will choose based on two scoring systems. The translation system, which says, how likely is my translation to mean the same as the original sentence? And the language model, which says, how likely is this to be a sentence in the language, in the target language? Uh, so this brings us into the idea of negative evidence and why my emoji is not rendered well. Uh, so negative evidence is input that violates the rules of a language. So it's basically a bad sentence, like I orange is like, terrible sentence. Linguists very often use uh, negative evidence in order to pry at which structures our language allows. So a linguist observing this pair of sentences, I like oranges, that's supposed to be a happy emoji, and I oranges like, which is an angry emoji that looks even angrier now. Um, a linguist in looking at that will conclude that in English, the verb has to be in between the subject and the object. Saying subject, object, verb is not a sentence in English. Uh, but according to Chomsky and theory, which encompasses most of the field, uh, kids don't use it. Kids don't get uh, negative evidence while they're being exposed or get very little negative evidence while they're being exposed to a language and manage to learn a language all the same. So we have human linguists, human experts can use negative data to pry at structures. Human, the best human language learners don't seem to be using it. If 
you need any expansion in this, I have a series of linguists on the second row that will be happy to talk about it. So, can computers benefit from negative evidence? Can they be more like expert linguists and less like babies? Uh, there is no way to give negative feedback to traditional n-gram models. Uh, if you have a, uh, traditional language models are done via uh, mostly n-gram models that count the frequency of n-grams. They try to maximize the likelihood of the corpus that they're looking at. And you can't really tell them, hey, look, this one was good, this count was good, but this count was bad. So if we were only using traditional n-gram models, we would say, well, we probably can't use negative data. But neural networks, on the other hand, are being used more and more for language modeling. And neural networks can benefit from positive and negative reinforcement. You can uh, do multiple classification neural networks uh, where you try to pry at specific parts of the structure uh, via telling the network, this sentence is perfectly OK, but this one that looks very similar is not. Uh, and that is my theory, that we would be able to benefit from ungrammatical data via this. So we're going to go into negative reinforcement. How would exactly would we do this with neural networks? Well, I just gave you a little introduction about it, but this is not what the talk today is uh, about. Um, basically, I want to use a binary classifying convolutional neural network that takes the whole structure into account uh, to pry at the problematic parts of the sentence. But for this, I need training data. And so where do I get on grammatical data? So in other applications of uh, such a system, we could, for instance, refeed the errors. So we could have a human rater being like, OK, this output of our system is clearly wrong. We're going to try to refit it into our language model as a negative input, so it will pry at the problematic structure in there. But in my case, I am trying to prove uh, that this is even possible, and in order to do that, I need large amounts of negative evidence. I need large amounts of ungrammatical sentences. While we have large amounts of grammatical sentences, just take any publication, we don't have those amounts of grammatical sentences. And specifically, we don't have those amounts of ungrammatical sentences in which we know the exact error. Because someone could just say, well, just do a word jumble. Just randomize a bunch of words that will look, that will most likely be a non-grammatical sentence. But it will just be too far away from natural language for us to draw any conclusions. A linguist could equally not draw any conclusion from the fact that uh, me let us ground is not a sentence. OK, so we want to get what we know from language into that negative evidence. So what would be the benefit of training with negative uh, input? Well, we could refine our statistical-based systems, and we could directly control some kind of, of ungrammatical output that happen in those statistical systems. So in the state of the art as it is, we either have rule-based systems in which we control exactly what's going on, and if we have an input we don't like, we can just go, change the rules, break the heads of three linguists against it, and get it. But the industry is more and more, or like is predominantly, now, based on statistical models, well, where if something is doing something wrong in your language model, you'll just say, well, let's just give it more data, right? Uh, usually the way to solve problems within the systems is, well, you can refine your feature extractors, you can do a lot of things, but usually you're blind to the specific mistakes. So this would be a way to refit data with the specific mistakes. Uh, so let's get down to business. Uh, we need to generate faulty structures, but we want to generate faulty structures that A, look enough like natural language so that they will modify the recognition of our neural network only in the relevant points, and uh, B, in where we know exactly where the damage is. So for this, uh, I took a couple of ideas. I'm going to do number and person disagreement between subject and verb. I'm also going to be uh, doing some adjective disagreement. And in the future, I want to do subject or object accent, uh, absence, which is a structural problem. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, how exactly are we going to do this? Well, most of the kinds of errors that I've come up with so far are pertain morphology, which is the area of linguistic study where we study how 
words change inside the word to adapt a word to go into a syntax or into the structure of the sentence. Um, English is particularly bad for that because English has very little morphology. English doesn't conjugate verbs. It has a plural, but it's a very regular plural. It doesn't uh, modify adjectives, etc. Spanish, on the other hand, which is my native language, uh, does have a rich morphological system and is uh, really want to do to generate a lot of mistakes in uh, anyone trying to do sentences who is not a native speaker. So uh, I decided to go with Spanish and I decided to start with adjectives because adjectives are simple. And so who's going to do the heavy lifting? Of course, it's not me. Um, in order to corrupt my sentences, I need to first analyze them. So I need to use a traditional NLP system, like a parser, to analyze my sentence, then find what I want to corrupt, corrupt it, and then return it. For this, I'm using the Stanford uh, parser from the Stanford Natural Processing Group. You can't read anything there, but you'll trust me. On the left uh, is the analysis of each token. So each token has some text, some position, and a part of speech, and I'll be using that extensively. And on the right is the tree representation or the syntax of the sentence, which I will want to corrupt. So I basically took my whole database and just passed it through the Stanford Natural Language Processing System. The reason I don't have a live demo is I haven't gotten it to work with Python yet. Uh, we'll see how I can do that in the future. So this is slightly more readable, still a little bit small. Um, here I'm generating gender and number disagreement. The idea is adjectives in Spanish need to have the same gender as the noun they're modifying. So if I say carro, which is a masculine noun, I should say el carro rojo. If I said el carro roja, I would be doing a mistake. What's the benefit of this? There's very little, there's very few inflections in adjectives. You can basically have an A at the end, an O at the end, an as, an os, or an s. That's it. And if you have the wrong one, the sentence is wrong. So if you change the a uh, for any of the others, you'll have either a gender disagreement or a number disagreement. So in order to corrupt a sentence, all I have to do is find an adjective, check if it has one of these morphemes, change it by one of the other morphemes, check that that adjective exists in the lemmas, and then return the sentence with the adjective changed. This will produce very simply corrupted sentences of the kind, me gustan los carros roja. I like cars red or red cars, but with red, not quite okay. So based on that same idea, I evolved to verb number and person agreement. So verbs in Spanish have a wide range of conjugations. Anyone who has studied Spanish can tell you about how they still have nightmares about the subjunctive. So uh, we can modify those conjugations in order to make the sentence ungrammatical. And this will make our future systems more uh, resilient to conjugation, or more like likely to conjugate verbs correctly in their output. So uh, this is interesting in terms of structure because subject-verb agreement can be long range. You can have a subject, then a bunch of other clauses or other content, and then the verb. And so traditional engram-based models will not be able to detect this. You won't be able to know that uh, that verb is wrong because your subject is too far away, you've gone over your n-gram range. And as we all know, if you make n-grams too long, you have a horrible overflow of stuff in your computer and any probability will just be too little. So uh, since uh, this can cheat traditional n-gram models, we are in luck. Uh, the problem is verbal morphology, as I said, is way more complex. These are three tenses. I plan to do for mon most main verbs, uh, which is at least eight tenses. And we see for each tense, I have to define a lot of um, uh, possible inflections. The good thing is regexes can help here. And some, t some tenses, for instance, are very well behaved. Here, the second one we see, the morphological model of regular past imperfect of the indicative is very nice. There's only two uh, middle morphemes. And then there's four person finishes. And you can take this one and replace it 
and replace the ending, and you will have a verb that exists but is wrong, which is what we want. On the other hand, the present, for instance, has so many variations, and regex doesn't really have good support for accents, so you can't uh, really catch your thematic vowel or the vowel that has to be in the, in the inflection, and so we have to just list everything. So some horrible tenses give us problem, but the past imperfect, which English speakers usually uh, don't remember to use, uh, is uh, fortunately very easy. So once we have detected that a verb is a verb, as tagged per the part of speech tagger, and is uh, conjugated, and has the kind of conjugation that our corrupter knows how to handle, we're in the game. We take the dissonance off, we define, we look at the other dissonances, which are the ending of the verb, or the other endings, and we check if putting each of them will generate a verb that actually exists, but is wrong. Uh, and once we find one that works, we just return it in the sentence. Um, if regex has had a good way to deal with accents and put them and remove them, uh, my life would be so much easier. But so far, I've just gotten to include them, which is good enough. Uh, Okay, the next thing I want to do is structural corruption, because so far we're only corrupting our poor little verbs and our poor little adjectives without prying at the actual structure of the sentence, at what is a subject, is a subject needed for the sentence, uh, how can I build a sentence with no subject or no verb, and these are the kind of things that uh, will really throw a language model off, hopefully. Um, the problem is, I haven't finished working with it, uh, partially due to the lack of a uh, dependency, a good dependency parser, which I haven't found yet. Uh, one by Stanford is under development, which would be great because I already have all their tools and I'm already using all their tools, uh, but uh, they probably will take a while. Um, Dependency parsing and standard syntactic parsing are quite different and dependency would be better for this. So I will keep you posted and what that does. And that's it. And I think I still have a little bit of time for questions, which would be nice. I have a minute for questions. That's great. Uh, so anyone? Yes, please. Uh-huh. I've heard about it, but I haven't researched into it. Yeah, I had, I had a problem in switching from working mainly in English to working in Spanish, because most of the packages don't have Spanish support. I don't know if Spacey does. If you know that it does, excellent. I will be checking that out, definitely. Ah, oh, nice. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, an example is, uh, let's say that the words are very easy to structure between female and male, and male or neutral. Mm -hmm. Because they can keep their three object tabs. But between male and neutral, I mess them up all the time. So that's where I make the mistake. Yes. So, uh, there's, there's some. There's some errors that would be. Yes. There are some errors that would be definitely more common in a human uh, learner. Uh, the question here is to check first, and I, I have an eye on that, to check first what language models, what, what state-of-the-art language models can tell us about uh, how common these mistakes are within the language models. So uh, the first stage of my research right now is once I have this uh, up and running, I'm going to run it against several language models and see if there's a significant difference between running perfectly okay sentences and running the corrupted sentences and see which of the corrupted sentences are throwing the language model off the most. Um, and that will enable me uh, to emphasize on errors that are more common. Uh, hopefully that will work. Yes, over there. Yeah, yo.
Yes. Okay. Uh, the question for the video is um, if there's any resources I can point you at regarding uh, doing kind of frequency work and uh, like spelling variation at the word level or the character level. Uh, most of the NLTK tools are ex extremely good for it. I don't have resources in my head right now. We can definitely uh, talk afterwards because uh, I do very little like word level uh, work. I'm, I'm mostly focused on the syntax, which like kind of shuns the word level. I have seen uh, interesting developments, however, in uh, character level uh, neural networks being used in translation and in language modeling. And we can definitely talk about that a little bit more. I would love to. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.